Hello, and welcome to the Farbank Fly Fishing School. I'm your host, Simon Gorsworth, and I'm super excited to talk to you about one of my passions, fly fishing. I'm here to share my knowledge, the things I've learned over the years about fly fishing, and try and get you up to speed with what fly fishing is and improve your fly fishing skills. In this first episode, we're going to talk about simply what fly fishing is. Nothing more than that. So without further ado, let's go down to the water and check out what's the difference between fly fishing and spin fishing. The very first thing we're going to take a look at is the difference between conventional gear and fly gear. What is the difference between the two? If you've never fly fished before, then let's explain a couple of very simple things. First of all, in conventional gear, you're going to have a weight on the front end. The weight could be a spinner like this, it could be a piece of weight with a bunch of worms on the end, it could be a bobber, but there's a weight on the end. And when you cast, that weight is what goes out to the fish. And in fly fishing, you have a very small, light little fluffy fly, sometimes a big one, but generally a little fly that has no weight. And that won't cast very well at all. So what casts in fly fishing is this big fat bit of string here called a fly line. That's your weight. And the fly line is what makes your fly get out there to the fish. The other difference is how you try and catch a fish. With spin fishing, the conventional gear, you're normally winding the reel in, and the winding in is what makes the spinner work in the water and attracts the fish. In fly fishing, you don't wind in, only at the end of the day, or when you catch a fish. In fly fishing, you retrieve, you pull in with your hand. It's called a retrieve. I'm going to discuss a bit about that later on. So let's take a look at that. Let's say I'm going to fish my spinning rod and I want to put a fly on the spinning rod and I've got a fly tied onto the spinning rod here. When I cast it out, you can see there's nothing happening. Right? There's no weight in it because the fly has no weight, the line has no weight, so it doesn't go anywhere. It falls pathetically next to me. It doesn't get out to the fish. And now I start casting the fly rod. The fly rod has got this fly line and this fly line has the weight and you can see how much easier it goes out with the fly on the end of the fly line. And that's the difference between fly fishing and spin fishing, basically, is that your fly line is your weight. Okay, simple enough, right? There's quite a bit of difference between fly fishing and spin fishing. But what is a fly? Well, you'll be forgiven for thinking a fly is a fly. You go around the riverbank and, and pick up a fly on the ground and tie it on the end or hook it on the end. And actually in the old days, and still in certain places like in Ireland, they actually hook a real fly onto a hook and fly fish that way but we're not doing that. Generally speaking, fly fishing is a form of fishing where you tie on an artificial fly that imitates what the fish is eating. It might be a fly, might not be a fly. There's flies called dry flies. Dry flies are flies that sit on the surface of the water and a fish swims along and sees it on the surface of the water and comes up and eats it. Your fly floats, it imitates that fly. That's a dry fly. It might be a fly like this. It might be a fly like a grasshopper. This is a dry fly, it floats, it looks like a grasshopper. And if a grasshopper is on the water and the fish are eating grasshoppers, then you'd fish a fly pattern like that. Or it might even be a beetle. It's not exactly a fly, right? A beetle, but they fall on the water and fish eat beetles. So that's one part of fly fishing is representing the dry fly. Fish also feed on things called nymphs. Nymphs are aquatic insects that live in the bottom and to get disturbed in the current and the wash down and you'll see trout swimming around and grabbing a nymph here and grabbing a nymph there and when that happens then you kind of fish a nymph but it doesn't have to be just flies you can fish patterns like this look at this beautiful thing this is a bait fish pattern and some fish are predatory fish and so they attack minnows and smaller fish and, and when they're feeding on that then this is the kind of fly you fish just magnificent fly this one uh, in salt water environments, you might fish crab patterns. This is a crab. Isn't that cute? So when you go to a saltwater fish, there's a species called a permit. Permit love crabs. And if you have the fish eating crabs naturally, well, guess what you're going to fish? You're going to try and fish an artificial imitation crab. You can believe it or not, you can fish mice. Trout eat mice, trout eat ducks, pike eat ducks. You can fly fish all these species by representing what they're eating in, your, in the tying that you make the fly or the ones you buy. And that's all kind of the natural imitation of their food. Um, the flies can be minute little specks like this little tiny thing because the natural is that size, or the flies can be giant fish patterns and this size and even bigger. So the multitude of sizes that you get, right? Don't worry about the sizes, but all of those I've talked about are the imitative foods, ones where the fish think their, your fly is what they are eating. Sometimes, Fish don't do that. Sometimes they don't eat. 
And so you still want to go and catch a fish, right? And so when that happens, you fish what's called attractor patterns or streamer patterns or uh, annoying patterns, things that don't look like food but annoy fish. For example, this fly here is called a woolly bugger, one of the most classic flies you can fish very, very deadly in a pile of lakes and rivers for trout. It doesn't look like a fly. It doesn't really look like a fish. It just annoys fish in you. And you fish it in a manner that would annoy the fish and the fish swimming along just goes Rawr! and have a good old slash at it. You've annoyed it. It's not eating, but you've annoyed it. And here's one more example of an attractor pattern. This thing's got a blob, orange blob. Again, doesn't look anything like the natural food, but again, it's something that can stimulate a fish to attack your hook and get on the end of your line. And that's what fly fishing is about. So flies, generally speaking, can be imitative or they can be this kind of attractor pattern. And either way, you'll catch fish with this kind of fly. So generally speaking, what they'll find is you're going to build up a collection of flies because if you have one fly and go fishing, first of all, it might be the wrong fly. Second, you might lose that fly. And then, then what do you do? So as you can see in my little box here, I've got a selection of flies that are imitative. These all look like natural things, buggy looking things in the water that I would take with me. And I've got more than one because as I said, if I lose one and it's been catching fish, I want more than one. And then on this side, I've got my attractor patterns, ones that if fish aren't feeding, then I'm gonna have these. So you'll build up a collection of flies as you evolve through this sport of fly fishing, this wonderful sport of fly fishing. So why? Why would you go fly fishing? Well, before we start about why you're going fly fishing, let me just tell you one thing right out of the gate, and that is fly fishing usually means you're going to catch less fish. You can get more fish spinning, you can get more fish bait fishing, and fly fishing, there are times when you'll catch more fish, but generally speaking, you're not going to catch as many fish. So do keep that in mind. Fly fishing is a culture. It's a lifestyle. It's a choice you make. And it's kind of, I, I liken it to hunters, whether they hunt rifle or shotgun versus an archery hunter. You are choosing to make it more difficult for you. And some people love that. I love that. I, I don't like it to be easy. I don't want to, I like the skill. I like the lifestyle of fly fishing. I like everything that goes into to making a perfect cast. So there's the casting, there's the deception of the fish by choosing a fly that looks like something they're eating. There's a way you move it so the fish thinks that the fly you've got actually is real. There's a way you set the hook and you play the fish. And all of those are really just build up in, into what fly fishing is. It's why you go fly fishing. As I said, it's a skill you'll build up over the course of time. And the casting, that's probably the hardest part to master. Generally speaking, usually that's where people kind of give up fly fishing because they find that casting is a bit too tricky for them. But as you persist and get better at fly fishing, you'll find that this fly fishing is just an incredibly awesome way of going out in the water. And, and as you progress through the fly fishing world and you get better and better at fly fishing, you're going to find there's this evolution. And to me, the evolution is go out fishing the first time and you want to catch a fish. Any fish will do. You want to catch a fish. And, and you catch a fish and you take a photo and you send it off to all your friends and Instagram and social media away. And then, oh, that was great fun. I want to catch another. And then I want to catch another. And then another. And you want to catch as many fish as you possibly can. And that's usually the stage that most people get to after, as a beginner. And then you've caught enough fish. Uh, you know where they are. You know how to catch them, how to deceive them. And, and your next challenge is, OK, I don't want to catch 100 fish this small. I want to catch a beast, a big fish. So your next natural stage is kind of catch the biggest fish possible. And again, believe it or not, with the course of time, you start to understand the habits of big fish and where they lie and where they feed and how to catch them. And you'll start catching big fish and go, OK, I can catch big fish. What's my next step? Oh, I know. What's the hardest fish? I want to make things harder as possible. So I'm going to find a fish that is in a technical situation that that isn't just going to require any old cast and any old fly to eat it. I want to catch the most difficult fish. And then the next step, you don't even care if you catch a fish. You're out there enjoying the beautiful scenery, the clear waters, the, the fresh air, the, the ethos of the fly fisher, the trickiness of the cast. A bonus is a fish, but you can go out for a full day and catch nothing. And plenty of anglers just literally will go out and sit on the riverbank and watch the water for ages, hours, waiting for a fish. And if there's no fish rising, hey, 
you've had a beautiful day out there on the water, just watching the water and watching the world go by and relaxing. And that's one of those beautiful things about fly fishing. Anyway, enough of my high horse about why I like fly fishing. As It's a huge passion of mine. I hope it becomes a passion of yours. And to do so, you've got to learn and progress through fly fishing's steps. And that's really what this is about. Now, going back to fly fishing, some of the basic fundamentals of fly fishing. One difference between fly fishing and spin fishing is that fly fishing has a leader on the end of the line. Not many other techniques have a leader. Fly fishing has a leader on the end of the line. So why a leader is important for fly fishing is pretty obvious and pretty simple, at least initially. A fly line, as we saw in the casting, is the weight. That means it's going to be quite thick and generally visible. So this is a piece of fly line, it just ends like this. And if I was to cast this and get it near a fish, the fish would certainly see this and scare because it's highly visible. It's not really camouflage or hidden. Even more obvious than that is the fact that you can't tie a fly onto the end of a fly line, right? You can't get it through. Even a big fly like this, you can't tie on because of course the fly line's way thicker than the eye of the fly's diameter. So for those two reasons, you want to do something. You want to attach a leader. And a leader, as you can see in this one, I pull it off. I've got a leader here, it's, I don't know, eight or nine foot long. And you can see that I've got the same fly line that ends in a big colorful end. And then I tie on a leader. And you'll note that this leader is pretty fat, right? To start off with, it's a fat lead. And you go, oh, well, that's going to be pretty visible to the fish. And how am I going to tie my fly onto that because it's so fat? Well, generally speaking, leaders are tapered. And as you get towards the front end, that leader gets thinner and thinner, less visible to the fish, and much easier to thread the fly on because it's much thinner. So leaders are tapered, and there's a reason for the tapering. And they mean that A, they're less visible to the fish, so the fish don't see them. B, much easier to thread the hook on and get your fly through the end of the line because, of course, it's thinner. And C, Perhaps more important than that is if you were to cast a fly line without a leader on. There is so much weight in the front end of the fly line here that as, it, as the line unrolls, that line will just turn over with a heavy plop, just turn over with a huge amount of speed and land on the water with a big impact and scare all the fish away. Utterly useless. So when you put a leader on, and this is why that leader is tapered from fat to thin, is the leader unrolls and gets a little softer and slower and lands beautifully and gently on the water. So a leader is very, very essential for tying your fly on, for not having the fish see it, but also for this presentation of your flies as they land on the water. And once your flies are on the water, well, then you've got to do something with it. And another way that fly fishing differs from spinning is the way you retrieve the line and, and pull the fly and, and, and basically what you do with a fly line. So enough gabbling here, can't really show you in the studio. Let's go down to the water and show you exactly what you can do with a fly line once it's out there. One of the other differences between fly fishermen and conventional fishing is that you, your casting style has a different type of option. One option is what's called false casting. Got my mate Tegan fishing behind me here, and what you can see is that he's casting the fly out, retrieving it back, and then making three or four casts to get it back out again. Right? In spin fishing, regular conventional fishing, you're going to make one cast, wind it in, one cast, wind it in. Whereas here, you might do a multiple number of casts in a row before laying the line down. But another difference in casting is that you can make a cast. Say you make a 40-foot cast, and you lay the line down, and it isn't quite in the right place. With fly fishing, you can pick up that 40 feet and put it back down in a different position straight away. Once again, with conventional fishing, you're gonna to have to wind it all the way back in again before you can make that cast and retarget. So those are your two main casting differences between fly fishing and conventional fishing. And part of that technique is, is when you've landed the fly down on the water, you're actually gonna retrieve the fly, you're gonna pull the fly in, or you're gonna push the fly out and give it slack. And really the essence of that is you're trying to imitate something the fish wants to eat. There's flies in the water like minnows, there's not really a fly, but that swims in the water. Sometimes you'll fish a fly, looks like a minnow, called a fly, and you're gonna try and imitate the way a minnow would swim underwater. Sometimes you're gonna find a fly floats down on the surface of the water, that's called a dry fly, and your fly, if you're trying to represent that, has to do the same. 
Sometimes it drifts underwater. It's a fly called a nymph. Nymphs live in the water and they cling to the bottom and then they, sometimes they're washed down by the current. Your fly needs to imitate that too. So there's a lot of technique in your fishing that you are trying to do with your left hand, whether it's pulling in, which is called a retrieve, or letting line out, which is called feeding slack. And that all you're trying to do is imitate something the fish is going to eat. And once you've got the fly fishing right and a fish actually grabs it, then you've got to set the hook. And that is something we need to talk about. And the reason we need to look at hook sets, particularly with fly fishing, is because the artificial fly is artificial. It isn't juicy, squishy, smelly, tasty. So when a fish bites your fly, whatever your fly is, they spit it out, they reject that fly really quick. They'll come in, grab and spit it out instantaneously. So when you know a fish has eaten your fly, you have to set the hook with immense speed, as fast as you can, as soon as a fish has grabbed the fly, or you've got to set it at the right time. But let's have a look at a few of my friends out fishing, some of the great hook sets that they do, showing you how a hook set is perfectly done and hook setting by waiting too long and missing that all important moment. So here we've got my friend Kayla. Look at that, there's a fish, you can see the splash. She sets the hook immediately, bang, fish on. That is a perfect hook set. In this scene, you can see Eland here swinging. There's the line go tight. And again, look at the instant reaction. He's lifted as soon as that line go tight and bang, fish on. Beautiful. And here's one more. Look at this, Anna straight into a fish. Bang, Gra gets the grab, sets the hook. These are perfect examples of what goes right when it goes right. You get the grab, you set the hook and the fish is on. Excellent. Now, on the other hand, things can go wrong, right? You can miss fish. Here's Kayla again, setting the hook and guess, ah, oh, it's gone. She missed that, for whatever reason, the fish spat the fly out. She missed the hook, mistimed it. And here we have Anna, look at this. She's fishing a beautiful clear river. There's the fish, there's the, there's the hook set. Oh, it's gone, it's not on there. Frustrating, it happens, that's fly fishing. Just bad timing, bad luck. And let's look at one more. Here's Matus on the river, there it is. Look at that line tighten and uh, it, uh, it, uh, it's not there. So you can get bad hook sets and you get good hook sets. The important thing about hook setting is that when a fish grabs your fly, react, set the hook, cross your fingers, and let's hope you get it timed right and you've got that wonderful experience having a fish on the end of your line. And really, that's fly fishing in a nutshell. I hope you enjoyed this first episode about what fly fishing is. And if you did, look at episode two, which is all about the basic fly fishing gear that you need to take out on the water. And talking about being on the water, please respect your environment, leave no trace when you leave the water, and above all, look after that beautiful fish that you're catching. It's a treasure. Thanks for watching.